Hi, and welcome to Thank Good It's Friday with Good Magazine. I'm editor Carolyn Enting, and today we're talking about sustainable style. Today I'm really excited to be talking um, to Gosha Payatek from the founder of Koto. Hi, Gosha. Hi. Um, Georgia and Jacob Fall from Nature Baby. Hi, guys. Hi. And we have our own digital editor, Hema Vara, who is also Hi. a sustainable style fashionista. <laughs> So the idea behind these Thank Good Friday live streams is supporting local businesses and also getting together over an afternoon glass of wine or drink. So um, we were also very lucky today that we have partnered with um, O Natural and Cono Wines um, to bring Thank Good It's Friday to you today. And we have some fantastic prizes up for offer as well. So um, O Natural are putting up four vouchers, $100 vouchers to win. And it's fantastic because O Natural is the hub for conscious uh, beauty, makeup, skincare, supplements, um, home gifts, things like that. So if you go to Good Magazine's website, good.net.nz competitions, you can enter and go in the draw for that. Um, Cono Wines are also giving us a wonderful 20% discount on their wines if you use the code um, TGIF, which spells Thank Good It's Friday. Um, go to the Cono website, cono.co.nz, and um, that offer is valid until the 17th of May. Also, I want to quickly congratulate our winners from last week, uh, Maria Williamson and Helen, Helen Tan. Uh, Maria has won the Win Lyndon Leaves Prize and Helen has won the Aleph Beauty Prize. So congratulations. So I thought we'd, um, it's so great having you guys here um, to chat. Um, because, and I thought it was such a great synergy because there's so much you guys have in common with Koto and Nature Baby. Uh, you both have your clothing made in India, organic cotton, you both scored A's in the Baptist Fashion Report, and you're also both featured in this amazing, beautiful book, which is just about to hit stores or be available called Wild Kinship. So, um, yay. It's so, let's talk about lockdown, guys. What have you guys been doing? Um, gosh, I understand you're a bit of a refugee at the moment, and you, you're normally kind of between London and Wellington. Where are you now? Um, yeah, the COVID refugee, well, a very privileged COVID refugee, um, very different to my journey when I was five years old, but um, I am in Mount Monganui, this isn't my home, um, and the, the, what's great at the moment is the Airbnb market has completely opened up to rentals, so there's no more housing shortages, really. Um, you know, it was really tough to find housing before. Um, my brother lives up the road, um, and we got here on one of the last flights into the country, which was pretty apocalyptic and very strange and nerve-wracking. And we got here and three hours later, um, the Prime Minister announced the level four lockdown. So we arrived at like nine in the morning and she announced that at 1 p.m. and um, been kind of sit, like put here for seven weeks now, um, which is, it's pretty idyllic really. We're close to the beach and um, working from home like the rest of the country, yeah. Right, yeah, but um, you, Georgia and Jacob, what have you been up to in lockdown? Well, we haven't had to move much. We, we work two minutes from home, so it's been much the same just without, without our stores open. Um, so we've been having, we've got two kids that are still at home. We had one daughter who was, um, who was in Australia and we were talking to her, she's, she's 21, and um, at art school over there in Sydney. And um, we were hoping she was gonna come home, but she decided to stay there. We were, we were thinking, how is she gonna survive? But she's managed to come through and she's quite happy. And so we've just got two kids here and we're yeah, working from home. They're, they're both teenagers, so it's actually quite nice to be able to spend a bit of time with them because usually they're preoccupied with other things, but the lockdown's kind of forced them to have to spend time with us. So that's been really nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. And, and how has it affected business for you guys? I mean... Well, we... We had two stores, two stores in Auckland, so they closed straight up. Um, so that disappeared. Um, and then in the first week, was, we were unsure if we could trade online. And luck, luckily in the baby category, it opened back up. So we actually had online sales going through lockdown four. So we were very, very fortunate that we could continue some form of business. Um, and yeah, but it was a massive change. We had to think about how, how we worked with our staff and how we 
um, the ones that were still working, how we kept focus with them and how we communicated. Luckily, we'd set up uh, remote working from home the week before. So we'd already tested that, so we were good to go. Um, and they've been amazing. They've managed, managed the business remotely from, the, from their flats or houses all over Auckland, mm. um, getting stock through, getting, getting messages out, running websites. And so we've managed to keep, keep that going. Um, yeah. It's been a great learning process, actually. It's actually been really positive for us. Yeah. As hard as it is, um, it's, it's been really positive. Mm. How about you, Gosha? Um, it's quite similar, really. Um, one thing is that I've been working remotely for basically five years now, close to six years. So I am on the same time zone now. So actually, it's really improved for me. But the same thing, both our stores have been closed, um, Auckland and Wellington. And it's, it, it's tough for, it's, it's tough because you have to become innovative and creative with coming up with new solutions because you, no one wants to just sit around and do nothing. So it's really like encouraging the people that we have, especially the store staff, because their hours have been affected the most to kind of come up with new ways of, of revitalizing the business. So we've got people taking photos of, of um, books that they enjoy reading, making playlists. Um, we have one person who's an amazing artist, so she's painting um, some of our clothing, still lifes. Like we're just trying to kind of be quite, ad hoc and agile and I think that agility is kind of spreading into the whole of the business which is a really interesting way of working it's going to come out we're going to come out with some um, superpowers after this I think and who would have envisioned that everything would change at once you know we have two suppliers in India and the reason we chose the second was was because we thought well if one collapses then we've got another one that was our continuity plan yeah. um, now a continuity plan. I mean, you can't have one. Everything is stopped. All our, We have 250 stores worldwide closed. Our retail stores are closed. Our online store wasn't functioning for four weeks. Um, and our, both our factories are also closed, making face masks. So how do you navigate through that? And it's so interesting that you can. That's the weirdest thing, is that you can actually navigate through this. And we are. And... Um, I think what's positive, I don't know about you guys, but what's positive is that the uptake online has been really positive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's giving me the impetus that, you know, it's not all going to crumble down. That's yeah. how I feel. Yeah. I, I think it's almost accentuated uh, what was happening before. You know, people were feeling, well, it was going online in terms of business, but people were feeling disconnected because we live in a digital world, but because we all had to disconnect, people are being forced to con connect in the digital world and become more human. And I think, yeah, that, that's been one of the biggest things for us that we've seen come out of it. Mm. And also people's like willing, like really wanting to get behind New Zealand businesses. That's one thing I've noticed. It's, yeah, been really great to see. Mm. And that's amazing. And obviously, you know, you're both fantastic ethical businesses. You um, can you talk a little bit about the ethos behind your your brands? Yeah, um, I there's so many parts to it, but essentially it comes back to uh, for well for me um, is to consciousness. So if you're consciously connected, you care about where things come from, and when you care when you care about things come from, you care about how it's made, how it's grown. And then ultimately you feel, well, you are, you're getting a better product at the end that lasts longer and feels better to wear. So when we started 20 years ago, it, there, wasn't, there wasn't much happening in organic textiles out, outside of like small clusters in Germany. And um, when we started it, we were just thinking it made sense. It made sense that the soil was left in a better state. It made sense that families weren't being messed over to make the product you know it made sense not to use pesticides because you didn't want that coming through on your on your clothes so i think a lot has happened in sustainability and there's been a lot of uh, process and standards put in place and it becomes this me measurement of what things should be which which is good but for us it's just it makes sense to do things properly in this way where, where things are taken care of I mean, you, yeah, you, Nature Baby is definitely a pioneer in the space, and and um, and so is Koto. 
I mean, um, Gosha, one thing I, I always love to ask you, um, because a lot of people don't know this, is why doesn't Koto use zips in its garments? Um, yeah, it's, well, I think I was the same as those guys, really. It's cool to hear, um, you know, your thought process behind it, because it's so similar to mine. And um, we are such similar companies. Actually, my son's only pretty much more nature baby, baby because of these guys just totally hooking me up for the last five years. Um, mm -hmm. So he still wears nature baby pajamas. He's he hardly fit them, but they're so good, you know. Who cares if they're a bit three quarter? Um, <laughs> but so good. Um, I love the fit. You know, I I, I love that it's natural. Um, and I think that's what happened with Koto at the beginning. I didn't come from a fashion design background, and I came with quite staunch values of how I wanted things to be. And one of the things was, well, how do we reduce as much as possible to keep the essence of some sort of, you know, to keep the essence of the design, but why do we need zips? And if you're a trained fashion designer, you'd just be like, that's nuts. And um, do we really need an option of 500 different buttons? Actually, I just want to use the natural ones because they biodegrade. It's, it's, it's actually just, it's really easy when you get down to those decisions. Why you wouldn't use a plastic button um, when we have a shell or a nut alternative. Um, we have um, and the zips came to that. We tried to source a zip where we, where the factory was transparent in how it was made and transparent with the um, employment processes, employee processes. Um, but there was the YKK couldn't give us any of those that information. So I thought, well, we can do without it. And it's 15 years on, we're still doing without it. And I'm still because I'm not the head designer anymore. The head, you know, the designers come in and. And that, that, that they're into it, you know, they, they're okay with it. And I say, you know, should we be rethinking what about trims levels? And they're like, no, just leave it all out, you know, continue with what we're doing. And um, also it really plays part into our circularity process. So when we return the garment, it's less to take away because of course you're gonna have to cut away certain elements to be able to repurpose that. So it really does, it's amazing. Like I've gone through ebbs and flows of thinking that we need more because of fashion needing more and this kind of trying to keep up with what everybody else is doing. And I've come full circle now, especially with COVID. And I'm like, we actually just don't need it. Yeah. So there's lots of thought processes all the time. <laughs> I'd like to know back in 1996, how your customers responded to that. You know, we got your skirts with the beautiful button and the pocket and it's somehow all there without a zip. It's incredible. <laughs> Yeah, and lots of, you know, it's, I guess it was quite free-flowing design and we've really embraced that. And over the 15 years, we've really learned to, to, well, to make it more desirable, more functional, fit better. You know, you learn a lot in your craft. When you're really limited to the fabrics that we use, we, we use a fair trade supply chain from seed to garment. And um, we have to develop every fabric from yarn. We develop the warp, the weft, the color, absolutely everything's unique to us. So there's a limitation to how much we can create every season. So we've become experts in the fabrics that we have produced. And um, I love that. I love that repetition. I think it's more relevant than ever now. We just don't need all this new stuff all the time. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I've just had a, um, a viewer question come through. Two questions actually from Liz. Um, she's asked both of you, or all three of you, sorry, um, both brands, um, are you likely to just stay online or and get rid of your physical stores altogether? And well, we'll start with that one first, and we'll, then we'll ask you a second question. Ouch, what a question. <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. That's, uh, I think we've been asking that question for the last three years, and um, I think we would never get rid of our physical stores. I think they would become lighter. I think if we were growing, we don't have many stores anyway, but if we were growing, we, would, we wouldn't we would look to have more more than one store per city. And, um, but I think still having them is important because it, I mean, with the, I guess with the, the areas that we're in, I think with Koto, you're in Te Aro, which is kind of a real, really lived in, in a city suburb. I think these, those areas are really important to keep thriving with some idea of um, a high street store where there's your baker and grocer and bookstore and cafe and, and and retailers where you can engage in that local community. I think there's so much missing in communities today. If you can't walk down to to a store, 
know who's behind that counter, talk to them about your day, talk to them about anything and and trade. I think if it all moved online, I think it'd be a loss to humanity. I think we almost need to protect these uh, stores. I mean, malls, you know, not, not so much. I'm not, you know, that will be interesting what happens there. But I think, you know, strip shopping in suburbs, um, in, in, in inner city fringes is important to our culture and, and happiness, I reckon. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think seem to really want to have a physical experience. Yeah. I think that kind of in retail, it is really about the experience now with retail stores. You kind of just can't walk in and have all these clothes kind of crammed everywhere. It's going to be kind of beautiful and really on brand. But in saying that, you know, online is doing really well. And I'm just so pleased that we have that kind of technology for you guys during the COVID-19 lockdown. Yeah. And also we've spent truckloads of money on our fit outs. And our stores are really new and they are insanely beautiful. We went all out, like all natural interior. We know where every single bit of wood comes from. We did a limited palette again, like our clothing. They are like gallery spaces. There's yeah. no way they are disappearing. I'm protecting them like crazy. Like, um, that they might have to just work operate differently now as we head into level two and then level one. They're gonna shopping isn't gonna look the same as it did before. It's mm-hmm. going to have a different feeling. Maybe there, ne- there needs to be more. Uh, maybe I, I don't even know. I don't know, but maybe there might be like VIP appointments, or maybe there'll be like um, you know limited numbers that you can have in there. There's going to have to be different hygiene um, practices. We're all in the process of planning that, but. Um, you, you, you can't open a store and then just shut it down. You, you've got to fight for it. Because when you've opened that store, and our workroom's above our store, we've got that whole beautiful corner. And I'm really proud of that, you know? I'm proud of that store. It's like it feels like my home. I don't have a home here. So I could easily go and live in there. Actually, that's a good idea. <laughs> 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 beautiful store. In fact, both all your stores are beautiful. Mm. And uh, the other question from Liz is, um, where are your factories located? As in, do you do all of your production in New Zealand? And if not, would you? Um, I guess it's a good chance to talk about fair trade and all that. Mm. Yeah, we we um, produce a few things in New Zealand, um, and unfortunately, what we've found has happened over the years and I would love to be able to produce more things in New Zealand but unfortunately one of the things that happened is a lot of the factories have closed down and the skills have gone and so um, consequently it's actually really hard to make things in New Zealand anymore. Um, Yeah so we mostly produce in India. Yeah. Yeah it's the same same as us so we, 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 we have two two factories one in um, outside of Calcutta and one outside of Mumbai and um, both specializing mainly in fair trade organic cotton so they they buy the they put down a deposit our time frame is 18 months from um, the beginning to delivery it's an ex- it's a very long-winded process that we want to change desperately and maybe COVID will help us with that. Um, but it's it's a bit ridiculous at the moment because we've been sticking to old-fashioned fashion models, you know. But um, but the um, but basically the, the factory puts down a deposit on with the farmers. So they have a in the fair trade model, we can we can we can trace back to where the cotton travels to, and then you can visit the entire supply chain, which we do. It's it's really it's quite interesting and really special. It's not something that um, it exists for most pe- for most brands. It's a it's something to be cherished, and we do pay a premium for that. That goes back to the fair trade labelling organisation and back to the farm communities. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I mean, we, we share some of the same suppliers between Nature Urban and Koto, and mm-hmm. and um, it's a very tight group of of makers that are that are the best and um and organic manufacturing and the cotton is grown there and it's made there um the area that it comes from is goes back to this real pride in india when um after um after they kicked the english out and they decided um as a protest they would make they'd weave their own clothes and gandhi did this massive walk from delhi pretty much to the same area where a lot of the cotton is, is um, manufactured now for both of the businesses. So there's a real pride there about 
uh, making and making in, in cotton in an industry that do, does serve the whole world. But it'd be interesting with COVID how much return there is to local manufacturing because as supply chains start to dry up mm. uh, because of shutdown, there'll be more need for local manufacturing. And to George's point, a lot a lot that closed down, like how how easy, you know, how easy is it to get that back up and going where we can make, um, you know, products locally more. Mm. Yeah, totally. And another a really special thing about where, where our cotton comes from, we have the same similar supply chains on some aspects. We, um, the farmers, the really small farmers, they have one to two acres of land. They grow food in amongst their cotton. It's all organic. It's pesticide free. It's GM free. And it's all um, rain fed. There's no irrigation. So it's so special. Like it's literally like a backyard full of cotton with some lentils. And um, literally is. Yeah. It's not Monsanto farms. These no. are cooperatives. They are people, farmers banding together to be able to get a better price for their cotton, which is what the Fair Trade Labour Foundation and other certification bodies that are around this make sure that this happens. Um, I love that we can support your brands as well and support the, I guess, global production that's made ethically. But then again, I know that a lot of people are pushing for New Zealand made production, but it's really hard, I, I guess, for fashion grads coming out of school it's kind of not glamorous to you know pick up a machinist job and I know there are a few initiatives like internships and talk of say training schemes but what do you think the solution is in New Zealand? Yeah I think it goes um I think that there are valid points in either way I mean we've chosen to manufacture in India because the cotton's in India and we're, we've got a the, the factory has a direct relationship with the farmers I mean that's that just all made sense to me but if you're bringing in fabric from overseas, why not stitch it here, you know? But you don't then necessarily know where that fabric's from. So there's flaws and positives and negatives in every system. I mean, and for fashion grads, I mean, yeah, not everybody wants to get stuck behind a machine. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of people with still sewing skills that have lost their jobs, and it'd be interesting to see if people band together to reopen factories um, as, as, you know, they're predicting... 20% unemployment rate in New Zealand. So let's let's see what happens. But it's all going to become a hell of a lot more localised because where are we going to go? The borders aren't going to be open. Mm. Yeah. Not for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you both scored highly on the Ethical Fashion Report as well. Um, and that's been a wonderful thing because it's done some amazing things for the industry in terms of accountability and traceability. And it's also been quite controversial as well. I just wondered if you guys could talk about that for a bit, about your sort of your view on that as a measurement. <laughs> yeah, it has been quite controversial. <laughs> um, my view on it is that it was really great for shining, you know, a spotlight on transparency and ethical production. And it's really made... Um, a lot of companies sit up and pay more attention to their supply chain, whereas before they maybe weren't. Um, but I did, my sort of critique of it would be that it wasn't really a level playing field between smaller companies and bigger companies. Um, yeah, obviously bigger companies have a lot of, have a lot more money and resources, et cetera, to throw at it. Um, and it's much harder for smaller companies to kind of be able to, perform in the format that they they wanted you to perform at. For us, it was easy because we've always had relatively um, seamless transparency. So, you know, it wasn't as difficult for us to complete that report as it was for some others. Right. Are there a lot of brands moving to a more circular model, but obviously you guys have kind of always had those values, which is fantastic. So what do you think about, you know, you've got, brands with ranges popping up that are say made from recycled fabrics or organic ranges would do you think it's going to be easy for them to kind of overhaul their systems or do you think it's going to be a, a long process I don't think I quite understood that question what do you mean so we've got there's quite a few brands popping up and that say they have particular eco ranges or say ranges made with um, organic cotton or recycled fabrics. Are you talking about like big companies that have yeah, these like small... big companies and some companies are coming out and saying that they're trying to be more transparent and they're right. kind of improving their supply chain but 
I guess ultimately from your perspective and your knowledge of what happens, how hard do you think this is? Um, I think it's great that some people are making headway, but so much of it is bogus. Mm. I mean, I went into like Weekday, which is H&M's teenage brand in London, and they have a bin, which is like, uh, put your used weekday clothes in here and we'll, it was something really vague, you know? And there was like bus tickets in there and receipts and like chewing gum and like a weird pair of jeans. It was just like, this is obviously a marketing ploy that has not been fought through and is not genuine. So I think a lot of it is, is just completely not genuine. And it, it, it's probably still ended up in the landfill. I doubt weekdays going into all the effort to, um, but maybe I'm, I could be wrong. I could be proven wrong, but I just looked bogus to me, that whole bin. I mean, I took a photo of it. Whereas, <laughs> you know, we're taking the clothing back and it's not about saying, hey, we've got a solution for it because no one has a solution because this is the circularity, this idea of circularity only began. I mean, with maybe with some brands it became, it, it was a lot earlier than us. But for us, it's been kind of the last couple of years we've really started thinking about it bringing the product back we've got to get enough volume so then we've got to go okay we've got this much denim what are we going to do with the denim can we repurpose it can we patch it what can we do to it okay we've got this much um organic cotton jersey okay is there a supply that can shred it and remake it into a yarn it's a it's it's constantly coming up with solutions for whatever you've got what colors have we got what can we do to it like it's it's really practical and time consuming and there's not much money to be made in it. It's a full, it's just, it's investment. And I just don't know whether those big companies that are purely driven by bottom line, whether they're actually investing in it properly. I'm a little bit dubious about it. I don't know. What do you guys reckon? Yeah, I agree. I listened to a really great podcast on the Guardian and it was about can fashion be truly sustainable? And they were talking about similar brands and it's not in their interest to change. I mean, it's great that the consciousness is, you know, and that connection is being made. That's what we can do. But those models are so big and they rely on such a high turnover um, for such a, you know, expensive footprint for the real estate that they've got running. It would never mm. work. A circular economy for them would, would never work. The only way a circular economy will work is if you have quality products that can be used again and again. And I think though that's the new kind of fashion model that will come up in the next five, you know, now but you know come through in the next five to ten years i mean they're saying 50 percent of fashion is going to be either uh, reused or recycled and it can only be done if the cotton fiber is strong if you know if it will last if that garment can be washed and washed again um, mm -hmm. it can be designed in a way that's classic and essential if it can be designed for circularity like you know no, no zip so it can go through um, I read this interesting report. There was um, the, this couple in New York who were looking at launching a um, baby hire range. They did all these tests on garments to see how long they would last through the washes and then they priced them up accordingly to how much you could hire them for. And we came up the same price as a cheap brand because you could go through eight children with our product instead of two with say a basic brand that was using shorter, uh, not you know not a strong cotton fiber and I think once it gets to that point you know it's just when it makes sense for people if it if it if you know it can go through and you know it can last you many, many seasons and that's what you're buying into now it, it will change that's that's such a good point and you know going back to the H&Ms you know it's really hard to reconcile because they're just such a big company even though they've got quite a robust sustainability report and they're doing a lot of good things but you know how do you still reconcile the eight dollar or six dollar t-shirt it just doesn't make sense and and um gosh i loved your quote in this beautiful book wild kinship where you said i think it's the designer's responsibility to take care of the end result of their product um and i know you're doing that with your swimwear as well and you you've got a mending program i understand in the wellington store yeah. you can bring back the garment if they've, if they've ripped it or something and you can or something's come apart um and you can fix it for them yeah, that's right. I mean, it all came about when I went to the um, the Copenhagen Fashion Summit a few years ago, and I heard this guy talk about his um, his um, circular model that he used towards architecture, and I thought, this is awesome. Like, we have to do this. And I think, you know, since then, it's become more of a talked about subject whether people are doing it or not. And again, it's like baby steps and none of these steps are going to make you money. 
it's just something you're doing because you believe that this is your responsibility as a designer. And that responsibility cannot be put onto the consumer. You're the one that's made that product. Why should they know what to do with it when they get a jam stain on their white t-shirt? You know, luckily we do cotton, so it ends up biodegrading, right? And if you do end up, if it does end up in the landfill, um, which I think this is the massive problem with polyester and synthetics, you know, such a vast, you know, difference between natural and synthetic. Um, but yeah, we, at Koto, you can, um, if anything is um, ripped or torn or broken, we'll fix it for free. Um, and we also do a Japanese technique, which costs a bit more money because it does take time. It's very beautiful and you can, it, it looks great on denim. Um, and we're learning new techniques as we go along. It's quite fun. Um, and especially because we have a really great connection with the store here in the workroom above. In Auckland, they will courier it down to Wellington to fix up. Um, Nudie have been doing that, you know, the machines in, the, in their denim stores, which I was really inspired by. And all their retail staff also know how to sew, which is so cool. Like, it's just yeah. awesome to constantly be upskilling people as well, you know? People are, yeah, they want to learn how to do many things. Um, yeah, and then we have the circularity program. And that really came about when we started doing that. We, we do swimwear, it's made from regenerated nylon. So plastic bottles and disused fishing nets and they pull them up in the Mediterranean and they remelt the nylon, regenerate it into a yarn, remake the fabric. Um, but there's a problem in that because it can still end up in the landfill and that's synthetic. And that's when we really got started thinking, okay, we really have to be responsible for this. This cannot go into the landfill. So um, we're taking back the swimwear, but it's trickling through. You know, we're not, we don't have mountains of this stuff because our clothes last, which is what these guys have been talking about. It's Koto lasts, it doesn't fall apart. So um, it's, which is great. So we're not seeing a massive return, um, but we're encouraging that return because I think it's going to be really interesting to see what comes back and how we can repurpose it and then how we can, how we can then incorporate that into our, our business model. I think it's going to be really cool. Yeah, it's just a start. You just got to start somewhere. Yeah. Had another question come through um, for you all from um, Nicolette. She's like asking, how do you feel about sustainability becoming fashionable? <laughs> For it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great thing. It should be, yeah. I mean, it should be an, an inherent part of, you know, like it was an inherent part of what we did, um, you know, from the beginning of time. We were always making sure that there was something that you could turn into something else and that you could plant something or you could use something, you know, fats turned into soap and... I mean, sustainability should just be part of everything that we do. If, I guess if in terms of talking about fashionability, is sustainable, sustainability popular? You know, should it be popular? And um, I definitely think it should. I think it's definitely trending at the moment, <laughs> which is probably yeah. quite terrible, but yeah, hopefully it will be the norm one day. But I also think it's great you say that with um, it's your responsibility as the designer to produce, I guess, sustainable and quality clothing but I also think for us consumers it's really important to educate ourselves and ask questions and choose brands that we admire because of their values because that means that you know we'll have more resources to do better so yeah I mean imagine a world with only chain stores how horrible would that be <laughs> and if, the, if people don't buy products from you know smaller designers that's we're going to go into a very homogenized world which would just be Awful. It's like what horror films are made from, you know, sci-fi thrillers. <laughs> not, not a good place. We've got to keep reminding ourselves. I think you're right as a consumer because we we all we all have flaws with that, you know. We all get tempted, you know. It's 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 not just because I have a sustainable brand, I live this like amazing lifestyle, you know? Not like that. Yeah. I was trying to work out where that comes from, you know, like how that the move towards an homogenized economy and, and fashion and um and watching our kids grow up you, you see it you see it you know because they're watching the media and it comes from a certain place and there's all these you know there's um there's a, the dialogue in there about brands and then malls become interesting because it's a place they meet and so i think it i think society goes through a um goes through a timeline where they are 
exposed to that and seems interesting and that's just how you become conscious after that you know how at some point you go you know it's enough it, you know what i saw it's it's bullshit <laughs> it's that right. i need to be local i need it you know it needs to be natural otherwise you know it's not the, the lies that i was told before that made it seem so sunny and bright you know it's not it's not true and so i think as a society we've got a responsibility how we can make that you know not necessarily popular or fashionable but like how we can all be more conscious about things. And I don't, I don't know how exactly you do that um, unless you, you know, go through a, you know, a goth or a punk phase and, you know, you've come through and you, which I'm sure everybody has. I remember going through those phases as a teenager and wanting to, you know, my friends be wearing Chinese jackets or, um, you know, muslin shirts or the horrible yeah. tube skirts in the 80s. And I'd say to mum, oh, I really want to get one of those. And she'd go, why do you want to dress like, everybody else why not, why not be an individual yeah. and it kind of really stuck with me it's like yeah why why do I want to why do we want to look the same you know and, and that, I guess that's where my individuality and the fashion started coming through um we can see a whole bunch of questions come through guys uh Susie wants to know do you try to keep your brands to a certain size or restrict production runs to make sure you can control your impact on the environment mm -hmm. that's, that's an easy one for us because we're just newborn to Four years, so <laughs> niche. Yeah, that's awesome. I think for us, we talk about this a lot internally because it's a really great question around how big do you get that? What what does growth mean in sustainability and having a sustainable brand? Is it being small and not producing much, or is it how much is is enough? You know, we have this question a lot, and it's quite quite an uncomfortable question, which I love. I love these questions, and um. If we get to kind of really try and understand what 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 what, our, what is our purpose here, you know, and I think that's that's the aim. And I think for us, our purpose is that we want we feel, and I've always felt from day dot that the message of a transparent production chain and clothing and a natural product and that is made fairly and priced fairly and take is a global message. So, in the world is a big world. So why shouldn't we reach every customer with our product when we can get we can eliminate if, if our if our factories can handle that production you know they're, they're, we're still not at capacity with our factories we're still a tiny brand we're a tiny 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 brand um sometimes you think that maybe nature baby and koto are big brands because we're in new zealand people know us half most of new zealand doesn't know who we are if i talk to people on the street they don't know who koto is you know it's it's um there's a relativity to it, I think. And I also think that I want to be able to get rid of some of these and horrible brands out there that are just producing crap and unsustainable crap and unsustainable models. And um, and we can be a solution to that. So why not have growth? And why, why should we be embarrassed to that? Yeah. Why should we be embarrassed I, to have sustainable growth to be a sustainable brand, you know? I agree. I go back to this kind of like really naive hippie version, you know, of, of a tree in a forest, you know, like if a tree, a tree needs to grow, so it, you know, keeps getting bigger and goes to the light. If, you know, if it's popular, more trees come through, the forest gets, you know, the forest gets bigger for, for the good things if it's naturally there. I that's think. That's awesome um, analogy. I love that. That's yeah, great. that's beautiful. I love that. I've got another question from Kate. She has asked, what other brands do you align with? Koto. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who else is coming through? There's so many good ones. I, I go back to this Guardian report. There was someone who made, and you'll love this, Gosha, um, this, this couple that made this fashion, this high end eco fashion brand, and they made it out of Prince Charles's nettles and Camilla Parker Bowles's horse hair, and they made it into a jacket. No. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of messed up. You probably hate it. But it's, um, <laughs> no, it's like, Anyone, anyone with that ethos that it's about, um, you know, how you can use natural materials in an innovative way that can cut through to, you know, to comp to popular consciousness. And I think a lot of people are being turned on to that now. It's more like bakers. Yeah, I think baby bread. <laughs> innovative. Yeah. People love about your brands is, you know, fashion is still a you know the and what you guys produce is still beautiful and people actually want to wear. And I think that's where you kind of are set apart from other brands because 
your kind of your clothes are still trendy you know stylish yeah yeah and there are some gorgeous new zealand brands you know kind of through this maggie Marilyn's doing wonderful things um you've got we are you've um you've got ovna ovich um some beautiful brands coming through who are really you know doing lovely things so we've got heaps more questions coming through so better do another one <laughs> um Tamara wants to know what are the biggest difficulties of being a sustainable business brand based in Aotearoa and how do you mitigate these challenges? Well, so far, the fact that we're here is a total advantage in the COVID world. We are winning. This is great. New Zealand's going to reopen and, um, you know, maybe we're going to go to level two. Maybe the stores will reopen. We're well ahead of the world. So right now, I don't see any challenges being part of the New Zealand landscape. Before, maybe it was the time zone difference and the, and the intense travel that we had to do um, to be able to show our product more on a global level. Um, but also being part of New Zealand, people love New Zealand and they trust New Zealanders and we can tell our story and we're quite genuine people. So um, I've never really felt much restrictions from being from this country. It's an affluent nation with a lot of possibilities and. Um, you know, there's just so much on offer here. And maybe because I came here with my family on absolutely nothing as a refugee from Poland, you know, we've been told that this, this is, there's a lot here. You just got to take advantage of it. New Zealand's awesome. Yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> Lovely. I, yeah, I, I mean, just to add to that, I think New Zealand's one of the easiest places in the world to start up a business. Yeah. Um, and grow and test things. And a lot of uh, a lot of big companies test things in New Zealand. I think when, in the banking industry, they would, they would test things through just because it was so, um, that we, we take on ideas and we experiment with ideas. The, um, our challenge has been scale. So our main markets are New Zealand and Australia. And so um, when, you, when you start start a business and you, you can start it up quite easily and grow it and you get to a level where you start competing with other businesses for uh, for production time and so you know num numbers start to become important mm -hmm. so that that's probably the only thing but I think in the, in, on, in the early days for us it was definitely educating people it seemed that we didn't have a big population to um, sort of market to and so we really had to kind of work hard to convert customers and yeah education was a big thing in the beginning for us yeah because we were just considered like the weird companies that like we were, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> our concept 15 years ago i mean people just yeah. was on the day they, they put us on the same shelf yeah. as lentils you know yeah. <laughs> oh totally yeah. like yeah. it's only really like in the last couple of years that people have just sort of started to not think that we're weird i know we're, we're like we're trending now yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally trending. Uh, so we've got another question from Liz. Um, how do you give back to your communities? Um, and many people can only afford to the cheapest for their kids. Yeah. Mm. Um, pay a little bit more and wear it for longer. Don't buy the, don't buy the cheap, you know, cheap products. You don't need, I mean, our, our products aren't expensive. We're not a fashion brand. We're not you know, the Marc Jacobs of baby, we're between say the, the warehouse and them and we're in the middle. And so it's a really, you know, it's a, it's a transparent cost. Also, I think like go to go on trade me and buy second hand. I think if you mm. want the quality piece, but you don't want to have to go to the warehouse I and mean, you don't want to pay, you know, new prices, I think second hand is the way to go. But I mean, and I mean on that we, so we base our stores in the communities. Anyone who rocks up to our door that needs to fundraise for a kindergarten, for women's refuge, uh, for midwives, for maternity units, we're, we're always giving um, product to them to help support them. I mean, we, you know, I guess we're not running a pink ribbon campaign or anything like that, we, but we look to support the local community and we look to support uh, you know, tangible things that can actually make, make a difference. We work with little more who look to get products back through to um, families that need it. Um, yeah, we try and do as much. I mean, you can, you can, never, you can never be a full charity, yeah. but in running a yeah. business, you know, is our, our view of we run a business to support those families making, to get good products for families that wear it. That in itself is, is a way of 
giving back and it, it does cost that more and those people buying into that are supporting that idea and supporting us and then we give back into the community again as much as we can. Yeah, I agree, um, Jacob. You know, there's so much that's already done on the level in India that is giving back. We also um, we also sponsor a orphanage there. Our production manager and um, senior pattern maker there went one year and got introduced to the orphanage. So now we can go there and specifically ask them what they need. You know, first time you go there with toys and random bits and bobs, but then you can actually start a conversation thinking about what they need. We we pay for all the girls to go to school for, for the yearly costs um, which in India it's not that much money so it's amazing what you can do to and it spreads quite far um, we always do like charity projects a few times a year we did one for it was called um, it was one for take three take three for the seas and sustainable coastlines where um, I love the take three for the seas model which is maybe a little tricky with COVID but every time you're out in nature, you just take three bits of rubbish and you put it in the rubbish bin. It's so simple. I mean, I still do it now here on the beach. I mean, I just can't help myself. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's been sterilized by the sea. But yeah, it's, um, so yeah. So we did the, the campaign called Single Use Planet. Um, but we're always trying to work, like with these guys, how they work with Women's Refuge or um, all the charities, you know, all the groups that you guys, listed we're the same you know if you get hit up on an email and you've got clothing of course you're going to give it like it's just obvious um you got to help the people that are around you because we're we are those sorts of companies that are going to do that because it makes sense you know yeah there's no point in having a whole bunch of stock out the back <laughs> no i'm not sure if you're aware gosha but there's a, a koto swap buy and sell Facebook group so people can actually no and there yeah you should look it up it's cool I'm gonna... send me the link I will send you the link yeah that is so cool no way four thousand people oh, yeah. I'll make your baby one two no yeah amazing yeah, I'd heard about the nature baby one but I didn't know there was a Koto one that's amazing and there's four thousand people there nearly yeah I spend a lot of time in these kind of groups on Facebook looking for coffee. It's so amazing to hear these stories because I still think, I still got that, you know, you still go, oh, no, no one knows about us. This is, <laughs> you know, you still have moments, great moments of doubt all the time, you know, because you, you, we don't connect with people enough. We have all the people in our workroom and we, we, we're quite insular in the industry. I'm sure those guys would agree. You're just away in your workroom and you become a bit of a hermit from the outside world. Um, so you don't really tap into all of this. Um, so it's quite, it's super cool to hear that. I love that. Yeah. But another question for a nature baby um, from Joan. She wants to know, uh, where do you get your ideas for the next season's prints? Uh -huh. um, it, the ideas come from all over the place. I wouldn't be able to pin it down actually. Um, but generally, our main inspirations are nature, the natural world, and um, the season that we're working in, and the inspiration that comes out of the season. Mm. Yeah, but apart from that, it's just all over the place. <laughs> um, so I was also wanting to ask you about how you guys both ended up in this gorgeous book. Did you know you were both in the book? We did. All in Gosha, how did you end up in the book? <laughs> well, um, we got hit up and then the author came to the workroom, which I loved. Like she came for a face-to-face -face interview. And I thought that was really nice how she traveled to meet people. I thought, I don't know, it seemed quite genuine. And then um, and we had a yeah, we had an interview in my stu in the studio kitchen. And then we ended up in this lovely book. <laughs> yeah. I should She's say that. The book is all about conversations with conscious entrepreneurs. Yeah, she, she's amazing, eh, Monique? And she, she's in she's in your land where you are at the moment, gosh. She's I know, in. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing all these like young mums with babies on the beach, yeah. and I'm like, is that her? Okay. Every time I'm like, is that her? And then I have to like go through her Instagram. I wonder if she's watching this. She put will be right, and then I'm like, <laughs> I would love to be able to just be like, oh hey. You know, I'm in the book. <laughs> she, she's great. She's really important. Those people that highlight 
things that they're passionate about and things that they think are you know good in the world i think so she she's a foodie from from tauranga and a writer and this is her passion project and she put the book together yeah interviewed everybody went to australia interviewed everyone in australia and put this amazing group of people together that we're on we're on the fringe have been on the fringes for years and um found this you know common thread between organic growers and fashion makers and people connecting into the community which has never never really been touched on so i think you know all power to her and you know grateful that she's done it for us it's the first time i'm actually seeing it i saw it on her instagram page but i love that it's like a hard cover and she's a great um the photography's beautiful you know because mm. you have to be selective with um when people come to you but it, straight away when i saw her aesthetic it was like yep yeah, cool let's do this you know yeah so i'm gonna move because the sun keeps chasing me i know it was chasing me before too but it's now moved yeah. <laughs> yes I, well i'm hoping i'm allowed to show it actually because um anyway it's monique hemmingson and we are going to be doing something about the book and the next issue of good magazine as well um which is great and um so guys what do you ever have a common question that people always ask you like something you, that you always get asked about your brand? I, I mean, I definitely, the flat out, the most common question is how do you pronounce it, the name of the brand? Um, so it actually is Kowtow. I just read it wrong when I, when I was um, researching names for the brand and I said Koto because I've never heard of the word. And, uh, but it is to kowtow to someone when you bow your head to the ground in front of the emperor in China. It's definitely not Koto, but it just stuck so now when people say kowtow to me i don't correct them because how can i correct when someone's actually saying it right like i'm <laughs> the one saying it wrong nike nike you know it's the same yeah. yeah but um that's flat out the most common question for us yeah so but you say it koto i can't help it i mean that's how i read it and that's how i said it and i'm <laughs> a determined person you know i'm like i'm right <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, not right, but it's just stuck, you know. Yeah. How about you, Georgia and Jacob? Ours is always how did how did you start? Mm. Um, which is an interesting, but yet yeah, very very elongated question. <laughs> so many years. And we both got our different perspectives on it as well. So yeah, yeah. How long has it been, guys? Twenty one years. 21 years, yeah. No way. Congratulations. Yeah. It's it kind, of, kind of started in India. I'm not going to tell the whole story, but it did start <laughs> pretty much near where we make the clothes now. So it's kind of a full, full circle. So you were pregnant? Yes, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That's awesome. Mm. Oh, that's cool. That's so great. And how's everyone enjoying their wine? <laughs> Oh, I finished. I, I, was, I had to slow yeah, down. Some more. It's a lovely crisp. I think I mentioned it before. It's a Marlborough Sauvignon from Cairns. Yeah, yeah. Really it's lovely. Because I, what I love about talking about really good brands, you know, we've got, um, you know, they're the first Māori owned winery in New Zealand and they're part of the Sustainability um, Wine Growers Association. And I love the fact that their value is all around people and the place, like the land and, and the people. So, yeah, it's just really nice to have those brands together like we're talking about with the book with wild wild kinship um as well you know and and uh yeah i just that's what one of the biggest things i love about working for good magazine is you just are working with meaningful people doing meaningful things all the time and it's it's yeah. just so great and again you know um you know guys going back to our natural they we've worked with them before over the years and and they're all about you know bringing the best brands to the people and choosing brands that are actually light on the earth or you know good for the planet good for your health sort of like people on the planet i just you know it's just it makes you just jump out of bed every morning and i don't know i just feel really that, that, that is, and i think that is new zealand new zealand has an ongoing dialogue with the land you know and i think we're reminded of that all the time mm. i think that's what what kind of makes us different from the rest of the world it's right here on our doorstep isn't it i mean i've been living in london on and off and i've just struggled with the place it's horrendous. You come back here and you're just like, this is insane, you know? I mean, the Papamoa sand dunes, even like, it's just stunning. Everything. You don't have to go very far and it's just wild and beautiful um, and preserved. And then it, it just fills you up, doesn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah. No, it's very, I feel very grateful in lockdown. I've been, I'm in Waterview and in Auckland and I'm originally from Wellington and uh, been locked down here. I've got so many lovely walks around me. And so I've been able to sort of get out to the beach and also into the bush and just been feeling so grateful. I've got these lovely places to recharge every day. And that's it's just yeah, so great. Talking, yeah, talking to my staff, you know, they're like, oh, so I know this walk now and I know the Southern Coastline walk and I know this walk. And I've been, I found six new bush tracks and I've got a river at the end of my street. <laughs> and, you know, I'm talking to my mate in London. He's like, and he's, he's okay. He's like, I'm really thankful for my back garden, which is like, it'll be a fantastic. <laughs> and then he's like, I said, what do you do? And he goes, well, I usually go to Sainsbury's and that's my walk. And I've just got this like grim image of him walking through this like blocks of street. I'm just like, we're so lucky. <laughs> we're so lucky. We had a wood pigeon fly into our backyard in uh, Grey Lynn. Kereru. Uh, first time ever. First wow. time ever. <laughs> well, that's amazing. I've had a lot of weird life in my garden too. Lots of tui and fantails. And it's just been you waka waka. Gorgeous. So I've been mm. told I have to wind it up soon. Um, our time has gone really quickly and I've got these other questions I wanted to ask you guys. We'll have to maybe, I don't know, do online Q&A or something. Um, and I did want to ask you quickly, are you guys taking part in the Together Today online shopping night um, that's coming up in May? Yes. Are you guys? Yeah, we've just, we started working on it today with Murray. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. fantastic. So, Hema, do you want to quickly say what that is? That's yeah. So it's a it's bringing together a whole lot of New Zealand brands, um, and it'll be online. I believe like a kind of a massive online sale. Showroom Twenty Two is putting it together. So watch the space. I think um quite a few brands have been advertising it on social media already. So great, and we will be too, which is awesome. And speaking of um going to our website, um, if you want to enter the competition to win a no natural, um. $100 voucher. There's four up for grabs. Go to good magazine or good.net.nz competitions. I've got, um, we've got a nature baby competition as well. So I'll pop that up after the live stream. Oh, great. Okay. That's really good to hear. And uh, we also, um, O Natural are also offering, I mean, obviously, Connor Wines are offering 20% off with the code um, TGIF. I have to keep saying it in my name. I'm sorry, out loud, um, which stands for Thank Good It's Friday. Um, and also, O Natural are also doing a 10% off um, if you go on and use the code GoodMag10. So um, it's been so great having you guys all here today, and it's just been fabulous. Um, having us. Yeah. So, thank you for having us, Carolyn. So good. Uh, it's been great and um, and we'll be doing another live stream here next week so um, yeah check back in next week guys and cheers cheers oh. thank you everyone <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome